Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series Signs. This series looks at the seven signs found in the Gospel of John, symbolic events that call us to embrace Jesus as the Lord who has come to redeem his people. Everybody should already be back at their seat and I should have been up here. Um, if everybody can come on back, we are going to continue our study going through the signs. We're looking uh, this Lent at the seven signs uh, that John has in his gospel. Today we're going to be doing the sixth of those signs, um, which is the Lord of Light. I'm going to just read the first seven verses in John chapter 9, but by this point in John's narrative, uh, these signs are taking up pretty much an entire chapter because every time Jesus is having a discussion to explain the sign, uh, afterwards but we'll just read the first seven verses and then you can always follow along on the screen or as always i encourage you to bring your bible so you can follow along there and the actual seven verses of the text are in your handout so hear now the word of your creator redeemer and king as he went along he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes go he told him wash in the pool of siloam this word means sent so the man went and washed and came home seeing sometimes when you're looking at a particular story you have to kind of give some background i remember a few years ago when i went and watched the first uh, of the Lord of the Rings movies and as you go through that series they sometimes have to at the beginning of the movies they would give a flashback to kind of explain what had gone on because if you didn't kind of understand the background the movie wasn't going to make a lot of sense so what they would begin the movie with wasn't really part of the movie it was one of those flashback scenes so that you could understand and we have to do the same thing today as we look at this text we're looking in John chapter 9 but it is part of a entire structure uh, from chapter 7 through chapter 10. John is telling kind of a running narrative. And in chapter 7 and 8, we learn that Jesus is in Jerusalem for the festival that is known as Tabernacles, or some translations will call it Booths. This was one of the greatest festivals for uh, Israel. It was one of three required festivals. And in it, the people were to live in booths or tabernacles, little huts that they were to make. And it was to remind them that they were pilgrims on the earth. And it was to point back to the wilderness wanderings. And this was originally stipulated even before Israel had gotten into the promised land. By the time of Jesus, it was a huge festival in Jerusalem. Many, many people would come. And there were two key ceremonies. One of them was a ceremony with water, where water was drawn from a pool and then was paraded around and then it was poured out. And actually, Jesus makes reference to that in John chapter 7 when he says, if you know anyone comes to me, there's going to be rivers of living water that are going to come out of him. Jesus is making a reference, an allusion to this ceremony with water. But the second one with them is a ceremony of light it harkens back to the fact that in the wilderness wanderings israel was led by the pillar of fire out in the wilderness and they would light these huge candelabras in the court of the women there would be all kinds of dancing and it would light up jerusalem and you have to remember back then it's not like it is today when you were in a city and the sun went down what did it become dark it was dark everywhere but on these nights when they would do that Jerusalem was lit up and could be seen from a long way around and it's in that context that Jesus stood up in John chapter 8 verse 12 and did one of his I am sayings and said I am 
the light of the world. He was making a reference that this Feast of Tabernacles, which should be reminding you of John's prologue right now, Jesus is saying, I'm the fulfillment of every aspect of that. And all of this is background because in John chapter 9, Jesus is still in Jerusalem. He hasn't left afterwards. We are still in uh, the, the connection with the Feast of Tabernacles or booze, and it's going to have relationship to the story that we're looking at today. So what's going on in this healing of the man blind from birth? Why is Jesus healing him? And what does it mean for us? Always the sign points to something else. So the sign is him healing the man, but what does it point to? So let's dive in and take a look. Now the sign itself, Jesus is healing a man blind from birth. In the first few verses we learn that Jesus and the disciples are walking along and they come up and they see a man, we're told, who is blind from birth. Notice there in verse 1. Now, one of the questions might be, well, how do you know he was blind from birth? We're not told Jesus asked him that. Maybe he did. But there's reasons to believe the guy was probably pretty well known. He's probably sat out in this spot for years and years and years. It's not far from the temple. If you were blind in ancient Israel, you pretty much had to live off of alms that other people gave you. And this man has probably been there. And what's critical for us that John wants us to know is just like the man who was lame for 38 years, this is a hopeless situation. This man has spent his entire life in the dark, his entire life, uh, at the mercy of others to try and give him money and support him and there has been no relief or help and on top of that it's even worse because the disciples then ask a question and this question reveals where people were rather than looking at the man with pity rather than looking and saying Jesus is there something you can do what's the disciples question Jesus let's start a philosophy class here we want to know who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Now, first off, notice the assumption. It's the same belief that Job's friends had in the book of Job, which is not just that suffering arises from sin, because it is true if there had never been sin, there would have never been suffering, but that each specific instance of suffering arises out of a specific sin and it can be traced back and so therefore if this man is blind somebody directly sinned that led to this it was summarized within judaism in a saying by uh, rabbi ami who said there is no death without sin and there is no suffering without iniquity when there is suffering when you see somebody blind there was iniquity and so the disciples question is well but this is kind of a problem because he was born blind so did he sin in the womb now you might sit here and say that's crazy but actually there were jewish rabbis that argued exactly that that it could happen there they would go back to jacob and esau and the tussling in the womb of their mother they said well esau was trying to kill jacob and that's why he got judged, because as an infant in the womb, he was trying to kill Jacob. So some people would have said, yes, this man could have sinned. But the disciples said, well, maybe it's not that. Maybe it was his parents sinned, and that's why he's doing it. He's being punished for the sin of his parents, perhaps. Now, before I get to Jesus' response, let me give you just a freebie here. It's not really part of the teaching, but take it home for what it's worth. Beware of thinking you know the secret counsels of God. God knows why things are happening. Usually you don't and I don't. And so we need to be really, really careful saying this bad thing happened because of this. People make all kinds of pronouncements. We love to do that, okay? And if you want to proclaim that you are a prophet and God has revealed it to you, I just encourage you to read in the... Uh, the Torah and find out what happens if you're wrong and then if you're willing to take that penalty go ahead and roll the dice but if you're not and I would recommend you not uh, God knows don't proclaim that you know see and that's what Job's friends did that's what the disciples the question that they're doing here and I actually dealt with recently in an after hours episode one of the little videos we shoot I dealt with this question of what is the relationship between sin and suffering coming out of 
Jesus' pronouncement in John chapter 5 to stop sinning or something worse may happen. And I related it to both that text and this one. You can find that in After Hours. I was asked this week, by the way, some people ask how do they get After Hours if they don't get our podcast or whatever. You can sign up for the podcast. You'll get it automatically. But there was a link in the bridge, or you can go to our website or see me or Steph, and we'll get you to it. But I dealt with, for five or six minutes, this question of sin and suffering. But notice what Jesus does. He rejects the dilemma. See, they've said, well, it had to be this man or it had to be his parents. That's the only two people it could be. And Jesus says, uh, no, wrong. That's not the case. Neither of those people sinned. I reject your dilemma. What's going to happen here, here's what's important. God's works are going to be displayed in him. Now, we're going to see that includes both healing, but it also includes salvation. God's works, because usually in the Gospel of John, God's works actually ultimately deals with salvation, this man coming to faith. And Jesus then goes on and he says in verse 3, look, here's what needs to happen, or in verse 4, as long as it's day, we have to do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And so Jesus here is basically saying, look, you've got the wrong approach. You're wanting a philosophy discussion right now. Here's what needs to happen. This poor man's blind. What are we going to do about it? What's going to happen? It's daylight because I'm the light of the world. And Jesus references back to his I am saying. He's referencing back to the Feast of Tabernacles. He's saying, remember, I stood up as we're doing all those light ceremonies and I said, I'm the light of the world. Well, here's a man living in darkness. What are we going to do about this? And we need to do this while we have time. And so here's another lesson just on the sideline for you and I. There is a place for discuss, discussing sin and suffering and doing all that, but the predominant thing that needs to happen when we see flooding in Mozambique, when we see the flooding down in Indonesia that we just sent money to, when we see suffering here in our own country, the predominant thing you and I need to do is not have a philosophical discussion, but say, oh Lord, how do you want me to be involved in relieving suffering? Because I will guarantee you that is what God wants us to do. Your theological answer may or may not be correct, but God does want us to extend mercy to those who are suffering. And so Jesus here tells them to do that, and he reiterates again, I'm the light of the world, so I'm here to do something. He's referencing back to John 8, 12, and what he's saying is, is when I made that I am statement, what was spiritually true, what I was pointing to in that statement, you're about to get a physical manifestation of right here. And note that throughout this entire chapter, what's in the background is this light and darkness, seeing and not seeing. And that's because it is true on a physical level, but Jesus is talking about it on a much grander scale than that. And so John then moves on to give us the actual sign, and it's very brief. Notice in verses 6 and 7, and I'm also putting up verse 14, and I'll show you why in just a moment. Notice, again, Jesus takes the initiative. We've seen this in several of the signs. The, the man who was lame for 38 years didn't ask Jesus to do anything. Last time when we looked at Jesus multiplying the fish and the loaves, nobody else brought up the problem. Jesus brought it up. And here, Jesus is the one taking the initiative. We're not even sure that the man knows that Jesus is standing there or what he's doing. But Jesus, we're told, bends down and he spits and he makes mud and puts it on the eyes. Now, there's a lot of arguing that goes on as to exactly why he spit and what's going on with the spit and all this kind of stuff. But spit's not the point. Spit is merely how he's making mud. Making mud is the point. Notice in verse 14, we're told, Now on the day that Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Guess what's against the Sabbath rules? Making mud is against the Sabbath rule. Once again, Jesus is doing something to say, I could just speak and heal the man, but I'm not going to because we're going to have another round of discussion about who I am. So I'm going to make mud and I'm going to put it on the guy's eyes. Now, the early church fathers also saw on this an allusion back to Genesis chapter 2 when God scooped up the clay and he formed a man. That Jesus here is scooping up the dirt 
making mud and putting it on the guy's eyes and it's an allusion back to genesis 2 and that may well be part of it as as well but the number one thing to understand is he's making mud because he's wanting to make sure yes it's against your sabbath rules for me to heal but maybe that won't put you over the edge after all this guy was born blind but i know what will put you over the edge if i make mud and heal him on the sabbath it's a twofer and you're not going to let that pass and he's right as it turns out they are not going to let it pass and so then jesus sends the man down to the pool named siloam now this is very much like if you remember every one of these signs jesus has been doing he's fulfilling messianic roles and one of the things that the messiah is doing is he's picking up all of these signs out of the old testament and he's doing them in an even greater fashion you remember elisha had sent naaman down to wash in the jordan and when he washed in the jordan his leprosy would be him, uh, cleansed and healed and so here jesus is doing the same kind of a thing remember he had done the same thing elisha had multiplied fish and loaves he's doing another elisha miracle here and he's going to send him to the pool of siloam but it's important that john tells us it's the pool at siloam siloam is a pool that hezekiah had built there's actually a picture here of what they think is the pool of siloam another little archaeological thing they've got hezekiah had built it as part of an aqueduct system because the assyrians were going to come and they were going to come and probably besiege Jerusalem and the problem in the city is how do you get sufficient water so Hezekiah had built a tunnel underground from a spring that would feed these pools and so the pool was actually named sent which is what Siloam means because the water was sent from the spring into this pool and then the people of Jerusalem could get the water and the Assyrians would never know how the water was getting there because unlike Roman aqueducts it was not above ground it was below ground is how it was actually done and so john tells us here the word siloam is the greek word the hebrew name of this pool was shaloa from which we get shalia or comes from the word shaliach which means to send and so john says this word means sent and you can actually read about this pool if you want in isaiah chapter 8 where there's a prophecy regarding emmanuel coming and in the midst of it god says you're rejecting the waters of Shiloa. You are rejecting Siloam for, and you want Assyria. And Jesus here now sends this guy down. But part of why John's telling us is this, who's the sent one in John's gospel? Jesus. Over and over again, he says, I'm the one who's been sent. The one who sent me told me to do this. So all of this is tied in, but there's one other key thing guess where they got water for the water festival in the feast of tabernacles from that pool okay so jesus is again linking that's why you got to start by going back to the feast of tabernacles jesus is linking it in and in every possible way he's jumping up and down he's putting a spotlight and saying i'm the fulfillment of everything you all are doing every festival you do it's me I'm the fulfillment of it all. And by the way, I'm going to rub mud on the guy's eyes to make sure we have the discussion so you can't miss the point. Then the amazing thing is, so this guy's been blind for his whole life. You would think the healing, you would get this like long description, right? I mean, let's be honest. If an American televangelist healed some guy blind from birth, how many episodes of the show do you think we would have talking about that? John gives us what in Greek is just about four words or something. Go, wash, and he comes seeing. Very simple. Because John's making a point. It's nothing for Jesus to heal the blind. It's nothing. He's already spoken from a distance and healed. He has multiplied fish. He's healed a man who was lame for 38 years. He can do anything. And so for him to do this is nothing. It's told in the barest of possible terms. Jesus just says, go, as he's been doing throughout these signs. Go. The man goes, he does what he's told, and he comes again seeing. Now that's the sign. The question is, what does the sign point to? We're not supposed to stare at the sign. We're supposed to stare at the reality that it points to. And the reality is, Jesus is the Lord of life healing this blind man points to the messiah as the lord of light 
He's at the Festival of Tabernacles. He's been there at this ceremony with both water and light. He uses these together to say that I am the one we're talking about. And the entire chapter is full of this dichotomy. Now notice also he's doing this because the Messiah was the one who was going to open blind eyes. If you look in Isaiah chapter 42, for example, verses 6 and 7, Isaiah has a whole section known as servant songs, and this is early in that, and they have a lot of references to the Messiah. And Isaiah 42 is one of them. And in verses 6 and 7 it says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Now this is repeated in Isaiah 29, 18, Isaiah 35, 5, Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. All of these places, over and over again, it references that Messiah, one of the things he's going to do is he's going to open the eyes of the blind. So it should not surprise us when we come to the New Testament One of the miracles that Jesus does that is spoken of most often is healing the blind. I'm going to put up a whole list of them here so you can jot them down while I talk or you can look out on the website and the notes will be there. But it's Matthew 9, 27 to 30, Matthew 12, 22, Matthew 15, 30 and 31, Matthew 21, 14, Mark 8, 22 to 26, Mark 10, 46 to 52, Luke 7, 21 and John 9. And no, none of those are parallels with each other telling the same story. Those are individual records of Jesus healing the blind. And the one in Luke 7 is in the context when John the Baptist has sent the messengers and said, you're not acting the way I thought you were going to act. Are you the one? And Jesus says, go back and tell John, the blind see. I am the one. I'm fulfilling the signs. So Jesus comes and he does this. Now here's something I did not realize until this week and if somebody can show me uh, an example in scripture i will gladly get it but neither jared nor i knew this you aware that nobody else in all the bible ever heals the blind elijah raises the dead elisha multiplies fishes and loaves he makes axe heads float there is nobody in the entire old testament that i'm aware of that heals the blind And in fact, in the New Testament, the closest we come is when Saul of Tarsus is knocked off and he's got the scales on his eyes and Ananias prays for him, but that seems to be a different thing. Here, Jesus prays for a man who's never seen and he is healed and does this. Nobody else in the scripture. And that's because this is a sign Yahweh said, this is what I, Yahweh, do. There are several places he does this. One of them is in Psalm 146, verse 8 where we are told the Lord, that's God's covenant name, Yahweh, the Lord, Yahweh, gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. So John has picked this as a sign. There's all kinds of ones he could have picked, but he's picked this because as we're moving along, he's saying nobody else does what Jesus does. He is Yahweh come to us you're in the feast of tabernacles well God has come and tabernacled among us you are looking at light coming out of the darkness Yahweh is the one who makes darkness turn to light you are looking at those who are blind and dwelling in a land of darkness the Messiah comes this is who he is powerful sign Jesus is the Messiah the Lord of light Now, wouldn't it be glorious if the story stopped there? Now, you would think if you were there in Jerusalem and day after day you've walked by this guy for decades and he's there and he's been blind from birth, you might think if you met him on the street, you would be really excited to find out he was healed, right? And you might think wrong because that's not where the story goes. Notice I'm going to run through uh, these fairly quickly. But the neighbors are astounded when you read in the, in the verses from verses 8 to 13 or 14 or so. They're astounded and they're like, what, what, are, aren't you this guy that we've known all of our lives? 
And he's like, yes, I am. Well, what they do, amazingly enough, is not throw a party. They take him to the Pharisees. And they say, uh, yeah, this guy uh, was healed. And notice, amazingly, the Pharisees get him. And that's when John tells us that little trick in verse 14, just like he had done in the previous story. Now, the day that Jesus did this is the Sabbath. John's held that information from us. And therefore, the Pharisees ask him how he had received his sight. And then the man says, he put mud on my eyes. And what's going off inside the Pharisees right now? Glory be to God, you got healed. We're so grateful mercy was shown to you, right? What? He did what? He made mud? Now we got a problem. And so he says, and I washed and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. You want to talk stone cold blindness? Right there. They, they, they cannot see all the Old Testament verses Jesus is fulfilling. They cannot see it. He made mud on the Sabbath. But some of the Pharisees were told, but how can a sinner perform such signs? I mean, look, this is not the first time we keep arguing with this guy. But I am paying attention and I'm reading and it seems like everything that the Messiah is supposed to do, he's doing. So they're divided. Now, they ask the, the man who got healed and they turn and they say, so well, what do you think about this guy? And in verse 17, he says, uh, I think he's a prophet. That your eyes were open, so what do you say? And he says, well, I, I think he's a prophet. Now keep that they're asking him here. Notice what they're going to say in a little while. But the Pharisees are upset, and so their next turn is, you're making this up. You weren't really blind. Apparently, you just, I mean, this is like a long-lasting ruse, right? Because he's a full-grown man. He did it from, from birth. This is like a long trick, apparently. Decades. You've been sitting there acting like you were blind, but you're not. So they call his parents in. And they're asking the parents. They cannot believe it in spite of all of the evidence because they are blocked off. He made mud. If he, had, if, if he makes mud, he can't be from God. Therefore, he can't have done this. Something's got to let us out of this. So parents, was he really blind? And the parents say, uh, well, we know he's our son. We know he's been blind forever. But how he got his eyesight, you need to ask him. He's grown up. And their reason for doing that is they're afraid. Because they already know if you say Jesus did something good, your standing in the community is in severe trouble. You're out of the synagogue. You're going to get kicked out if you agree Jesus did this. So in verse 22, we, John tells us they're afraid because anybody who's siding with Jesus is the Messiah. All this talk is going on and anybody who sides with him is going to be put out of the synagogue. So they're afraid. They at least say, you know, well, he was born blind, but, but we don't want to touch it other than that. Now, you might think at this point the Pharisees would say, well, obviously this guy was born blind, and somehow Jesus healed him. But oh, no. If you think that, you haven't paid attention to humans. Right? You haven't paid attention to yourself, probably. Right? And have you ever been in an argument with, like, I don't know, a spouse? and you know you're wrong, and what do you do when you realize you're wrong? You double down. That's what you do. When you realize you're wrong, you double down, right? I, yeah, y'all act like you're not there, but I know what it's like, because I've done it myself. So they summon the guy again, and they say, give glory to God, which is their way of saying, you're going to take an oath here before Yahweh. You're, you're going you're to take an oath in the name of the Lord. Tell us the truth. We know this man is a sinner. And I love the guy says, well, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind. And now I see. Amazing grace. That's what I know. Now, the Pharisees then turn around again. They're, they're tripling down now. And they say, what did he do? Tell us again what he did. And the guy, I love his response. He says, I've told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want me to tell this again? Are you wanting to become his disciples too? 
which is really going to make him popular with him. So they hurl insults at him and say, you're this fellow's disciples. We're disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And so notice there's this back and forth. The Pharisees are frantically searching for a way out. They're trying to get the guy to provide a way out. He's not doing it. They're going back and forth. The technical Greek term for this is an argument. That's what's going on here, right? They're back and forth, and they're upset with this guy. Tempers are flaring, and they say, they end by saying, we don't even know where this guy is from, but we do know he's a sinner. But they've made the wrong statement in saying they don't know where he's from. Because the man jumps up, and he says, now, that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. And we know God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Impeccable logic. Surely the Pharisees are going to say, you got us. Right? Oh, no. They're going to go back and say, hey, you were steeped in sin at birth. How do we know that? You were born blind. It was you or your parents. But either way, you're a sinner. So don't you be lecturing us. We know this man is a sinner. And so they throw him out. They drive him out. Now the amazing thing at this point is Jesus comes and he finds the man. This is a link back to John chapter 5. I'm going to talk about this a little bit in After Hours this week. There's all of these links between this section and John chapter 5. And so Jesus comes and he finds the man. And he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And this guy, you remember the guy in John 5 is pretty obtuse. This guy's not. He says, well, Lord, who is he so that I can believe in him? And Jesus says, you have now seen him. So you couldn't see before, but you can see now. You're looking at him. And he's the one that is speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. This became the confession in the early church. I've mentioned it before. You get baptized in the early church, you said that that phrase, I believe, is one Greek word, pistueo, I believe, I believe. And it's based on this guy. This guy says, Lord, I believe. And then he worships Jesus. There is no ambiguity with this guy. We don't know what happened with the man in John 5. This man, we know what happens. He falls to his knees, and he says, Lord, I was blind, now I see. I was living not only in physical darkness, I was living in spiritual darkness, and now the light of God has dawned. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you are the Messiah. I believe you are the light of God. And John is telling us right here, this is the proper response to all the signs we're looking at. If you see the signs and you don't end up saying, Lord, I believe in falling to your knees in worship, you don't understand the sign. You don't understand what is going on. And so the story continues a little bit and Jesus drives home how we understand this and apply it. He's calling people out of darkness into the light. See what Jesus has been after ultimately It's merciful and kind that our God is. But the ultimate thing wasn't even the physical healing of that man's blindness. It was calling him out of darkness into light. And Jesus is doing that for every one of us. Notice how he concludes in verses 39 to 41. Jesus says, For judgment I have come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Now notice, we don't have any record of Jesus striking somebody blind. So he's not talking about literal, physical He's swapping over and saying, this is why I'm here. There are people who think they see, and they're going to become blind. And there are people who are spiritually blind, and they're going to see, and they're going to come into the light. And notice, some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty of sin. But see, you claim you can see, and so your guilt remains. So that's what Jesus is driving at. What's the key? It is humility. If you will admit and embrace the fact 
that you were born blind. You were born cut off from God, apart from Him, and your only hope is the mercy of God. Then Jesus says, then you'll see. But if you want to say, well, it's not really that bad. God and I are kind of in a bargain. We're, we're working this thing out together. Then Jesus says, you're blind and you don't understand. The key is the humility to admit our blindness and our need for healing from Jesus. And those who refuse to humbly admit their sin and their utter need of Jesus show they're blind and that they would prefer to live in darkness rather than the light. Now, that may sound strong, what I just said, but I'm going to show you Jesus said that. This whole thing is a living out in front of the disciples words that Jesus had spoken earlier after his conversation with Nicodemus. In John 3, 19, Jesus says this. This is the verdict light has come into the world but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done by God. It's been done in the sight of God. Notice how similar these two passages are. They're both judicial languages. Jesus says, for judgment I came. In verse 19, this is the verdict. Both of them deal with light and darkness. Both of them deal with people who admit they were blind and now see. People who come out of the darkness into the light and then people who choose to stay in the light and jesus's point is very very clear if you are in the dark you are in the dark for one reason you like it in the dark you would rather be in the dark and hold on to my sin i like my sin better than i like jesus if you want to see that writ large look at our culture right now what goes on all over our culture right now and people want to make every statement in the world as to why they do it but jesus is very very clear there's one reason you and i don't come into the light because we hate the light we're not neutral towards it we're not i like it a little bit we hate it because the light exposes our sin and what we love is our sin it's I'm rereading, I'm doing a lot of reading of Augustine this year, St. Augustine, and I'm in the middle of his confessions right now, rereading it again. And it's so funny to me, you go to the story of him stealing the pears as a kid, and everybody gets all confused, and they argue back and forth, and they think he's making so much of it. They don't get what Augustine's saying then. What Augustine's saying is, it didn't matter what I did. I stole the pears because I loved sin. That's why I did it, because I'm warped. I'm bent. I'm broke. And so are all of us. See, the second he says that, they say, well, there's got to be another reason Augustine's saying that. Because if, if that's true, then I'm warped and bent and broken, and we know that can't be the case. See, but Augustine's point is, oh, yeah, it is. Whether it's stealing pears or it's doing something else, we sin because we love to sin. And we don't want to come to the light. And that's exactly what Jesus is driving home here. And so some people refuse to do it, but thanks be to God. Jesus says there are those who by the grace of God, they come out of darkness and they come into the light and they come in saying, I'm broken. I am shattered. That there is nothing in me you should desire. But oh Lord, if you will have me, I am yours. Friends, that's a picture of what the gospel is. Now, how do we apply this? I'll be very brief and we'll come to the table. The question that this sign puts to you and me is very simple. Do I love the darkness or the light? 
Jesus came to make the lines clear. For judgment, I came into this world. I've come that it's very clear now which side is darkness and which side is light. You don't have to have a lot of debates. It's very simple. How do you respond to me? If you respond to me in faith and belief, you love the light. If you don't respond to me in faith and belief, you don't love the light. No matter if you teach ethics at a major university, it doesn't matter. You don't love the light if you don't trust and believe in Jesus. Claims to confusion, claims to ambiguity are a sham. And they are a positive decision to love the dark and hate the light. Because they're a statement that well, Jesus didn't make it as clear as he claimed. Y yes, he did. He made it very clear. It's wide open for us. So there is no neutrality in this war between darkness and light. As I've said before, I say there is no spiritual Switzerland, friends. There's nowhere that's neutral. We are in darkness or we are in light. Each human must choose whether to remain in darkness or to come in the light. So the question, let me put it in a couple of different ways for you to mull over. Have I left the darkness for the light? Here's how you answer that question. Do I admit I was born spiritually blind? You were as blind spiritually the second you came out as that man was physically. That's one reason. See, John could have picked numerous healings. Why did he pick this one? Because this man was born blind. And he wants you and I to understand you were born blind. So was I. We were born in the dark. Do I admit that only Jesus can give me spiritual light? There is no other source. There's nobody else that can heal this. Do I admit that or am I clinging to something else? Do I admit my natural hostility to God and to righteousness and my natural love of sin? See, this is what it means to be converted. This is what it means to be a believer. And notice on all of these, none of these are, do I believe that guy? This is not, you know, I've been watching Bobby and he's kind of sketchy. I think Bobby does like sin. That's not my concern. Brett likes sin. That's Brett's problem. Brett was born blind. Brett loved darkness and hated the light. Do I admit that? And then the last question, because this is what it means to be a believer. Those who are converted are reborn. Have I been reborn so that I'm now growing in hatred of sin and darkness and have a desire to walk in light and righteousness. Because that's what it means. See, Jesus says, you were in the dark, and then you stepped into the light. That man was blind, now he sees. Remember John, very famously in his first letter, is going to say, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So if you claim to walk with him, yet you're walking in the darkness. You lie, and you do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Have I been reborn so that I'm, not that I don't sin, because we always still struggle with sin, but, but I now, I don't want that. And friend, that will put you out of step with our culture. Because we love sin. And for those who say, I don't want to be that way, you will bring down the wrath of the gods of our culture on yourself. But you will have the pleasure of the one true God resting upon you. Jesus is calling us out of, his, out of darkness into his marvelous light. If you are here this morning and you have never responded to the gospel i urge you with every fiber in my being here flee the dark it is never for your good sin may seem pleasurable for a season but it always deforms it always 
degrades. It always destroys what it touches. It is never for your good, friend, or mine. And we will always look back and rue it. Hear the voice of Jesus come out. Now, if we're here as a believer, and you say, yes, I have done that. Yes, I have admitted those things. And yes, I am his. We're going to come to the table. Because here at this table, there are many aspects of what we do. And since we come to the table so often, we talk about different ones at different times. But one of the things we do here is we say, yes, Lord, we have heard your call. You have called us out of darkness and into your light. And we declare our allegiance to Jesus. When we come to this table, we are saying, I do, I'm like that man. Lord, I was blind, now I see. I believe you are the Messiah. I believe you are the Son of God. I stand and I take my place with you. Here, we openly confess our own love of the darkness, our own places we've struggled. We openly confess we have no right to this table. But by grace, we are brought here. Friends, if you believe that, you are welcome to come and to feast in the face of your enemies, the spiritual forces of darkness. You are welcome to come and feast at the table of the Lord. You do not have to be a member of our congregation to partake in this meal. You do need to be a Christian. When I lead us in prayer in a couple of minutes, we're going to be saying and praying that when I take this bread, and I take this cup, I am making a proclamation about myself and my sin and about Jesus and his righteousness, about darkness and about light. And I am agreeing that I believe these things. If you believe them, please join with us. If you do not believe them, you shouldn't participate because you would be making a statement that you do not believe. Uh, and then please see me right afterwards and we'll talk. We'll go out and get a cup of coffee and sit down and chat about what this means. Uh, as always as well, if you are here and you have an allergy to gluten and you need gluten free, if you just raise your hand, we will get that to you. Friends, let us come to the table. For what I received from the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, I pass on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out so that your sins may be forgiven. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Holy Spirit of the living God, we pray that you would come, that you would fall upon us now, that, Lord, you would take these simple elements and you would meet us in them, that we might feast upon the very grace of God. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. As you get the elements, please hold on to them. We will take them together in just three or four minutes. And I encourage you to consider those questions regarding our own sin and if the holy spirit should bring to your mind any darkness i encourage you confess that and let the lord of light cleanse you lord in the beginning when all was dark you spoke and light shone forth for you are the lord of light and when your people wandered in the desert waste, you led them by a pillar of fire, for you are the Lord of light. And when Israel languished in dark exile in Babylon for her sin, you kept them with the promise that those walking in the darkness would see a great light. And on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light would dawn for you are the Lord of light. 
And so in the fullness of time, Jesus came. And in him was life. And that life was the light of men. And though we tried to extinguish that light, it shines on to this very day, offering the light of salvation to all who believe. Today, we take this bread as those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lord of light broken that we might be saved take and eat my friends Lord like the man near the pool at Siloam we were born blind our spirits were blind to your bright glory. Our souls insensible to your dazzling beauty. Our minds oblivious to your illuminating truth. And as we lay blind and helpless, shrouded in deep spiritual darkness, you spoke an enlightening word, and light pierced our blackness illuminating our gloom we looked up and for the first time our spirits beheld the brightness of your glory our souls gazed at your dazzling beauty our minds marveled at your illuminating truth and we fell at your feet and we worshiped you today in taking this cup we say Lord, I believe. And we worship you as the Lord of light who has given us sight. Friends, take and drink. Holy Spirit, as you hovered over the dark waters of the primal creation, before the word was spoken and there was light, so you brooded over us when we were shrouded in darkness, until the word of truth shattered our gloom, and we were, who were children of darkness became sons and daughters of the light. Hover over us now, Holy Spirit, so that we might live as children of light, full of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Reveal to us what pleases our Lord, so that we might have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Holy Spirit, drive the desires and deeds of darkness far from us, so that we do not stumble in the night of this evil age cultivate within us the desires of deeds and deeds of light so that we might walk in the bright ways of your will we ask this not on our own righteousness but in the righteousness of jesus christ in his name for he is the lord of light amen let's stand together and this week the benediction will be out of it's a paraphrase out of psalm 27 i encourage you to receive the blessing of the god who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light because the lord is your light and your salvation may you never fear because he is the stronghold of your life may you never be afraid even if forces of evil advanced against you, may the Lord make them fall, so that even in the face of an army, you will be confident as you gaze upon the beauty of God and seek Him. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Be blessed. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.